We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Before we get into the catch and early buzz, and I know you wanted to reset on the Calvin Ridley conversation we had yesterday. There were a handful of comments in YouTube saying the the night at the uh, Renner and Gale household <laughs> might be a little heated because we, we came out hot and yeah. it did feel in the moment kind of first takey, kind of Skip Bayless argumentative. But like I had passion about it. You had passion about it. I do think that we've had some conversations off air. Um, you know, you came into my room last night. You knocked at like 10 p.m. You're like, hey, man, is there any chance we've not? No. But I do think we've had some good conversation about it. And it was it was engaging conversation. Before we get into that, I just wanted to add some notes to the top of the podcast. One, our speak pipes and, and mailbag episode is on Fridays now. It comes out on Fridays. Speakpipe.com speakpipe slash tailgate is where you can, sub, you can submit a voicemail. I think it's up to 60 seconds in length or 90 seconds in length that we will play on the show. We play the best ones every single week. And then if you leave a comment on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, send that screenshot to us in DMs or leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, we'll find it. And we'll get those listener mailbag questions also on that Friday episode, the bonus mailbag episode. The other thing is tailgate promo code. Go to pff.com, subscribe using promo code tailgate. That's 25% off any subscription at PFF. Tailgate merch, you can get also on pff.com, pff.shop.com. A lot of tailgate merch already out as well. And then Master Gators, hammering that home as well. Master Gators Masters. gear is coming. The Gators. The Master Gators gear is coming. Gator Nation, feel ready. Catch an early buzz. Let's start with the Calvin Ridley reset. Yeah. Can I start? Yes. I'd like to, one, apologize for how aggressive I came at you. And two, <laughs> no and two reframe kind of my viewpoint. Because I do no. think originally I did not make an apples to apples comparison. Though there are reasons to compare two suspensions in the NFL, it's not apples to apples compared to domestic violence to the situation that Calvin Ridley's in. And I originally was saying this is too much for Ridley because of those suspensions in hindsight. When really I, I, wish, I wish I could have, the argument I want to make is that I am not satisfied with the NFL's viewpoint on their suspensions of domestic violence. I'm not satisfied. I think the games that they're, you know, the amount of games that has been handed out to video evidence abusers in the NFL is just not satisfactory, in my opinion. However, that doesn't mean the NFL can't have a zero tolerance policy for gambling on the games because the integrity, like you said, the integrity of the shield, protecting the shield, protecting the league matters so much more to them mm -hmm. in terms of making money, like actually putting together a financially winning product than it does letting talented football players who obviously made mistakes that they view however they view, letting play again. Like letting Ray Rice take the field again is better for them financially. Unfortunately, unfortunately by, for fans and all, that's unfortunate. Better by them than letting guy who gambles on the game. In hindsight, I wish my argument was they should suspend domestic abusers more but the zero tolerance policy for gambling in the NFL is completely understandable. And I honestly understand a lot of the viewpoints you made. Yeah. So my, I, I didn't s speak very uh, eloquently yesterday because I actually didn't even know we we're going to go down that route. <laughs> uh, so my, my point were, points were all over the map. But I think the biggest thing to me that I didn't really, uh, like I say, say perfectly yesterday was that you're comparing the morality of the two situations. Or yes. you were when you're comparing those two. In my opinion, this isn't a morality thing. Like this is a like protect you said protect the shield thing. They're two different things they were comparing here. Obviously, domestic violence is morally far more bankrupt. It's not even close. And if anyone thought I was sympathetic towards you know domestic abusers, I if you're a podcast listener, long time podcast listener, you know that I'm a victim of domestic violence. It's true. Like quite literally, I had my ex girlfriend beat my ass on three separate occasions. Last time she got arrested, I had not. I had to talk to a cop and say I'm not going to press charges. It was. I know the physical toll it takes and the mental toll that I'm still dealing with to this day. So I am not defending these people whatsoever. Uh, I was more saying that like, those are legal issues. I want those guys to face legal consequences. Yes. Like I, I, to expect the National Football League, NFL, to be able to conduct thorough enough investigations to properly vet and make decisions on the, like you said, 
the length of suspensions for these guys. Yeah, th th that is a problem that the legal system mm -hmm. is should face, and that the fact that these guys are getting slaps on the wrist is, in my opinion, where my sort of ire lies in the whole thing. For sure, yeah, yeah, yeah no, like because there's not enough conversation about like how long did Ray Rice go to prison? Like, yeah. how long did these domestic abusers even face anything from a legality yeah. perspective? And it's you know, the perception of the NFL. Again, when you say protect the shield, I also feel it's important to say protect the shield's money. Yeah. That's what they want to make over anything. And letting any ounce, and you, you said this yesterday, you may have not thought it was eloquent, but I do think it was important. You said this yesterday in that the shield's money is more negatively effectively, more negatively affected, unfortunately, by gamblers, players gambling on the NFL than it is letting domestic view abusers play. And that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. Should they be more negatively viewed by audiences and by people follow the NFL by letting domestic abusers like run scot free essentially sure but they view it as protecting the shields money and how you protect the shields yeah. money is not letting the perception of players gamble on the games yeah to me the sort of corollary that I couldn't think of in the moment for like the legal corollary is like you commit like I said you commit domestic abuse you shit you kill a person you, you drive drunk and kill a person accidentally you'll face you know five to ten years behind bars if you openly plot to overthrow your government you are going to jail for like 20 plus years yeah you may not commit a violent crime that like mor morally driving drunk and killing someone obviously morally worse like if you think that the government is corrupt and you're trying to overthrow your government you are going to face far se more severe consequences because you are like you said, the protecting the shield thing, you are jeopardizing the integrity of the organization that runs, whether it's society here, mm -hmm. the National Football League. So, yeah I, yeah, I think, like I said, a year is appropriate. And, and it just so happened that it's a guy who's a high profile player, but like what you're protecting against is maybe a lower profile player who has some sway in some way, shape, or form who's not making the kind of money mm -hmm. that a Calvin Ridley is that could actually have or stand to gain very much financially on the fringe that you just can't have those guys ever being ever thinking that's okay final point on this again unsatisfied with how the nfl suspends or currently suspends like proven evidenced domestic abusers you can't be satisfied with how they've yeah. done that two completely understandable of how and why the nfl would have a zero 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 tolerance policy on players gambling on the nfl regardless of the way of the gambling i will say this i'd say this is my last point tom brady gets caught for fifteen hundred dollars on some parlays i think he gets two games calvin ridley gets caught who's already stepped away from the nfl it's easier to kind of push him out of the league tom brady no, gets caught no 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 really quarterback would be even worse you think oh no true no you're right maybe i'm wrong betting. maybe i'm wrong yeah. well I, I think part of me still has the stain where he didn't get a lot of suspensions for like cheating and yeah, deflating to balls. me that's the more apt comparison if you want to bitch about Calvin Ridley being too long it's guys who have literally cheated or been caught cheating on football fields not getting that much of a yeah. suspension so that's the one let's get to the Carson Wentz trade when I saw this I thought it was a joke I swear to god I thought it was a joke I did not think I I checked the Adam Schefter report like four times to confirm it was actually his Twitter account because I did not in any way shape or form honestly think this worse of a scenario this bad of a scenario could happen for Washington I thought the worst case scenario for Washington would be they couldn't get a quarterback, Malik Willis doesn't fall, they don't like Kenny Pickett, and they end up signing Mitchell Trubisky or Marcus Mariota in free agency or Teddy Bridgewater, James Winston in free agency. They don't they instead trade two third round picks, including a conditional third that will be a second round pick if Carson Wentz plays more than 70% of the snaps. So essentially it's second and a third for Carson Wentz and the entirety of his contract, $28 million. They traded essentially a second and third round pick to pay Carson Wentz $28 million with, in my opinion, similar tiered quarterbacks going to be available to them in frenzy with Marcus Mariota, Mitchell Trubisky, Teddy Bridgewater, James Winston, hell, even Ryan Fitzpatrick. That, in my opinion, is one absurd for Washington entering a new era, the commanders, to do and pull off. Two, magic, wizardry, Harry Potter fucking jealous for Chris Ballard. Chris Ballard getting a second and a third back for Carson Wentz and not having to pay him another dollar. The Colts enter free agency with more cap space available, $70 million than any team in the NFL. This is a legit reset button for them. Incredible. Now, did, were they wrong to trade for Wentz in the first place? Yes. Do they not have a first round pick this year? Yes. But when you make mistakes... It's easy to lean into them and let it play out, right? And let Carson Wentz pay him $28 million to take you to another 10-7 and 7 season. Instead, they try and they understand the sunk cost fallacy and they, get, they move on from him, not for a fifth, not for a sixth round pick. They get a second and a third back, essentially. That's fucking insane. Dude, I, I, so I, the initial tweet I saw was from Adam Schefter. He said, Colts are trading QB Carson Wentz to Washington for a package of picks that is thought to include two third rounders. 
my initial thought was they're swapping third rounders. <laughs> like that's my initial thought. It's basically just a throwaway. Pl- like please take this contract. We don't want it on our books anymore. A- almost like you know the Brock Osweiler two two of far lesser grabs. They literally threw that away with a pick as well. But I was like, okay, they're just amicably getting rid of them for to a team who's going to take that chance. No, the basically the. <laughs> The football team's giving up real picks here, a second and a third. Like, if they would have given up a second and a third last year, they could have gone up and gotten Mac Jones, you know, from where they were sitting at 19. They could have leapfrogged the Patriots and got Mac Jones with a second and third. But they used those instead to pay Carson Wentz. So, uh, shrewd move. We'll see how it pays off. I, I, I don't get it, man. I don't get it. Like, I think they, I, I said this, I was talking in the office or talking to people upstairs in the office, and I was like, what at best does this get them? They're going to be like six-point dogs on the road in a wild card game next year. Yeah. Like that's, that, that, that's, in my opinion, the ceiling. And could they go on a run? Could they go on this? Like, and maybe. But in my opinion, the best-case scenario for the Washington football team with this move is there are six-point dogs on the road in the wild card round. That's the best case. They probably don't make the playoffs. Fuck, Carson Wentz didn't make the playoffs last year. I could not believe it happened. Again, Chris Ballard, absolute wizardry. The Colts still aren't in a great situation to attack the quarterback position. That's kind of where I wanted to go next. Like, they don't have a first-round pick. They're not going to be in on this quarterback class. I doubt they make any significant moves to move up to go get a quarterback in this class. In my opinion, they're staring this quarterback market in the face right now. They could trade for with very little draft capital. They could trade for with very little draft capital. Kirk Cousins, Jimmy Garoppolo, maybe Derek Carr, but it's unlikely. We know that the new Patriots brass there, Ziegler and McDaniels, love Derek Carr. Maybe Gardner Minshew, but that's interdivision. And then via free agency, they could sign a Trubisky, Mariota, Winston, Bridgewater, Dalton, Fitzpatrick. The other trade I would throw in there is potentially Jordan Love. I don't know what they do. I think if you were banking on the Colts making the playoffs in 2022, it would have to be a trade for Derek Carr or Cousins. I think any other quarterback here, Garoppolo, Minshew, any of these guys, you're hanging on to a thread. You're throwing darts. You're yeah. Th- you're really throwing darts. You, you won't believe, though, the only person on the timeline who liked this deal for Washington. I know who it was. I know who it was. I saw the tweet. I, I, I couldn't engage with it here, I'll read the tweet. I'll read the tweet. For the first time in Carson Wentz's career, he has a true number one receiver in their prime, and there are no great QBs without a true number one receiver. Okay, th- that's... Uh, it's already a task there, but he said like, Carson Wentz is the only quarterback in NFL history to throw for 4,000 yards in a season without a 500-yard wide receiver. With the Terry 25, so uh, scary Terry, Carson Wentz won't fail. That's Man- Dan Orlovsky. Oh, no, oh, oh, that was Dan Orlovsky. I thought that was Dan Orlovsky. No, did Orlovsky defend it too? I thought I saw I Orlovsky say Orlovsky's he liked the, loved the move for Washington or something. I thought he, even he's out at this point. He hasn't even tweeted today. Oh. Dan Orlovsky's... No, he said, my reaction to Wentz being oh. great is simple. He was he has this season to save his career as an NFL star. I so thought even Orlovsky, I saw, He might have deleted him, something. I swear to God, I thought I saw something. He, he called him a top 10 QB as recently as 2020. Even Orlovsky's out on him. Even Orlovsky's out on him. Rough. Rough stuff. Make, uh, make Chris Ballard. Give Chris Ballard GM of the year now. It's a fucking... It's, it, he's got a healthy lead, my guy. Healthy lead. And I know they're not going to be all that competitive this year. It's going to be tough to get like a quarterback, like with we just said, right? With the market they're staring at. But to get back a second and a third for a failure, a literal failure, is so impressive. So impressive. It's just legitimately absurd. It, it I, it, there are to. some it books that give Washington lower Super Bowl odds after they made that trade. That's absurd. <laughs> it keeps going back to quarterback value, Dan. They never stop. Really doesn't. Really doesn't never stop. Leo Chanel and Traylon Burks are two notable players that had pro days today. Burks improved his vertical, I think, from 33 inches to 36 and a half. 35 and a half. 35 and a half, which is impressive. But he didn't, he, this was the more surprising thing for Burks. He decided not to run the 40. And he only clocked the 455, which was higher or you know longer than expectation. People thought he was going to be low 45s, high 44s type. So he decides to sit on that, even on a faster stopwatch there at Arkansas. That is a bit concerning to me. A little bit concerning. Someone on the timeline, I don't know who it was, apologize for no credit, made the comparison to LaVisca Chanel. I don't hate that. Like, I don't hate that. Yeah. LaVisca Chanel, I think, is was further away from being this re- the mm-hmm. route, you know, from a route running perspective and like playing the receiver position than Burks is now. Yeah. I don't think he's going to be like a complete project in that regard, but... That, that comparison is one of the first ones I've liked because I'll tell you what, I have not really liked the A.J. Brown comparisons. I hate the D.K. Metcalf comparisons now. And some people are making Debo Samuel comparisons. All those, you're high on 
crystal meth. Like, that's just not happening. Well, and the other number that he didn't even say, he improved his vertical, but he did the bench. 12 reps in the bench. Oh, what? DK did 27. AJ Brown did 19. I and did and 19 not to say that the bench is the most indicative number, but like, where are you storing all that weight, buddy? <laughs> like, what's all that? What's all that? What's all that 225 doing for you? You know, similar weight range to a DK Metcalf, to an AJ Brown, if it's not translating to speed, leaping ability, bench pressing ability. It's, it's safe to say that, that uh, it's, it's worse. I mean, we I, did some pump the brakes segment yesterday. I, I pumped the brakes a little bit on our, uh, we, we were talking about Traylon Burks as this consensus wide receiver one. Yeah. Pump the brakes. I, For, I like Lance Zierlein's take on it. So, so there's, you know, everyone says, you know, trust the game tape, trust the game tape, trust the game tape. Well, the game tape said, looks, or at least said to pretty much every single person who's watched Traylon Burks that he was a better athlete than this. Yes. So figure out why. Why is he not? Is it, is it Ja'Kai Polite? Is he not, does he not give a shit about football and isn't training? You know, like, it, what, is, what is the reason here? Why? He is, is he hampering an injury and just trying to power through it? Is there something but, like, it's not nothing. Yeah. You, you know, a guy showing up who, like I said, every single person would have guessed he'd test better than this athletically. Why? Yeah. And I think there is legitimate reason to go back and want to figure that out. Someone that exceeded expectations <laughs> and from a lot of people going back to the game right. tape and what they did athletically was Leo Chanel, your guy that you've been consistently putting Told in the you. top 40, if not in the first yeah. round of drafts. Uh, we saw him put on an absolute show at the Wisconsin Pro Day. These numbers are dumb, legitimately dumb for Leo Chanel, the Wisconsin linebacker, six foot three, 250, 250 pounds, runs a four, five, three, 40 yard dash at the combine, which is 87th percentile among linebackers. One, five, five, 10 yard split, 92nd percentile, 34 bench reps, which is lower than people expected. He did 40 at one point on video. That's 99th percentile, 41 inch vertical, 97th percentile, 10, eight broad, 95th percentile, three, nine, four short shuttle. You see sub four short shuttle, sub four second short shuttle at any position, at any weight. It's absurd. That's 99th percentile among linebackers. And then a six, eight, four, three cone, not better than my guy, Aiden Hutchinson, but still 91st percentile at 250 pounds. That is fucking special. Yep. That's, that's insanity. I mean, that's, that's your, I mean, it's one of the best athletes to come out of the draft at the linebacker position. It's true, like full stop. It just is. He's a freak. And now he has 31 arms. So he's not like, if he had longer arms, you'd be like, get this guy rushing the passer. And that's a, that's a rare athlete. And it still is. Um, and he's still going to be a weapon on blitzes, but yeah, I think this guy's punch day compared to, you know, other bigger linebackers who have gone in the first round of late, his tapes, and I'm just bigger linebackers. Just look at the athletic dudes who have been risers up into the draft in the first rounds, whether it's like Jordan Brooks two years ago or Jamin Davis last year, Chanel's tapes better straight up this. So yeah. I, I, expect I mean, he graded really well. The production's there, all that. I expect this guy to rise. Somewhere in the top 40 picks, I don't know. First round is always tough to lock in, as I like to do here, but he's, he's in that conversation. Jack Sanborn also did the agility. He's the other Wisconsin linebacker there. 405 short shot on a 6-8-1-3 cone, too. Like that, those yeah. are good numbers for Sanborn as well. But he was definitely a, like, it's like 20 pounds lighter. 20 pounds lighter. Yeah. And maybe it was a fast track at Wisconsin. Who knows? These are, these are dumb tested numbers. But that was when I saw that. So Doug Kide, who's a reporter here at PFF, got a screenshot or a, a photo of the testing sheet from Wisconsin Pro Day. I like double checked like four times. So there's no way. Crazy numbers for Leo Chanel. Before we move forward and get onto the 2022 NFL free agency preview, where we look at every single position, give our best landing spots and, and highlight some of the top guys, I have to remind you that this podcast is sponsored by Manscaped, the leading sponsor. Can I get a round of applause? Today, I'm excited to announce Manscaped launched their ultra premium collection. Believe it or not, it's not for your not so private parts. I'm talking about a leveled up hygiene routine with your favorite manly scent. This is an all in one skin and hair routine, skin and hair kit for the everyday man. It covers you from head to toe, literally. Manscaped is trusted below the waist. Now trust them with the rest. Join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with code PFF. I'd recommend using the products in this order. Hop in the shower and scrub it up to up that body with the Manscaped body wash. Lather your hair up with the 2-in-1 shampoo and conditioner to keep your noggin toggin'. 
Dry off and spray on the hydrating body moisturizer to reinvigorate dry skin. Put on the Manscaped deodorant for obvious reasons. Pop that Manscaped lip balm on. No one is out here kissing chopped lips. Getting dressed after is optional. Wear one great scent all day long. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code PFF at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code PFF at Manscaped.com. The power of attraction is now in a bottle thanks to Manscaped. Two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. When I, I did a road trip with my buddy in college from San Diego to the Florida Keys up to, up to Asheville, North Carolina and back over the course oh, of wow. like 32 days, we had a three-in-one. It was shampoo, conditioner, and body wash. We smelt like ass. For like, We had to buy Febreze just to spray in the car to sleep in it because we slept in the car. We spent $0 on lodging. $0. Ooh. We slept on the couch of the guy in Austin, Texas who helped found tiny homes. It was absurd. It was an absurd trip, dude. An absolutely absurd trip. We slept in the car multiple times. We almost froze ourselves a couple times. It was insane. But that was a cool trip. But the three in one, I wouldn't recommend. The Manscaped two in one, I think is something I can get behind. Let's start with the quarterbacks. Now, there are a lot of teams that I think will be buying into this free agent quarterback class, honestly. Like, I think there are a lot of teams that look at it and say, hey, we can get a starter here. So I want to identify what you feel in this class, who you feel in this class are starters versus backups and where you feel their best landing spots. Getting ahead of this, the backups are obvious. Andy Dalton, Ryan Fitzpatrick, maybe Mr. Trubisky, but Mr. Trubisky is the lowest ranked quarterback on a free agent board. Everything we're hearing in Indianapolis is that someone wants to pay him to be a starter. There was a report that came from Charles Robinson of Yahoo Sports saying the Giants want to bring in Trubisky to compete with Daniel Jones. Is there a bigger slap in the face the city of New York could get? The city that never sleeps has to stay up all night watching that? Mitchell mm. Trubisky versus Daniel Jones sounds like a legitimate nightmare. Anyway, let's start with so the full list yeah, right now. Like we're not even going to entertain. Tr- yeah, like, let's like, not entertain sorry, Trubisky. Like the, like the NFL could sign him. That's fine. We've from what we've seen, we disagree. Yeah, <laughs> I'll just say that. That's so a, the so the three starters we have highlighted, the three highest ranked quarterbacks on PFF's free agency board, which you can check out on PFF.com and get full access to with promo code Tailgate twenty five percent off any PFF subscription. We have Jameis Winston, then Teddy Bridgewater. Then Marcus Mariota. Best landing spot for each. I think Jameis. And, and now the thing about the Wentz trade, why we'd keep being like, why the hell we trade? Like, Jameis, you can go sign him if you want. If you gave Jameis $26 million next year, he would say, hell yes. And it would cost you no draft picks. And he probably would be as good as Carson Wentz. I mean, straight up, he was last year when he was on the football field for the Saints. So, obviously, like, I'm not going to say every guy who's like, Obviously, the Saints is a good landing spot, too, for him. But if he's going to leave, the place I would like to see him go is Pittsburgh Steelers. Got a real receiving core there to work with. Now, he doesn't necessarily mesh with Matt Canada and that offense. But, you know, he didn't necessarily mesh with Sean Payton and that offense either. And we saw him have a little bit of success last year. So, I like that fit if I'm the Steelers. And, you know, they miss out on the russ wilson sweepstakes to miss out on the you know whatever quarterback sweepstake you're going to make so that's who i like him to go to i I, i'm with you there i think that's a good spot and i also don't think they're like you said like they're not going to be in on this quarterback class they're too deep they're too deep to get some of the top guys let's get to teddy bridgewater that he goes back to the saints james is leaving new orleans i like teddy to go back to new orleans where he had some success where he ended up getting that big contract from carolina and and i think he could still have some success there uh if michael thomas comes back healthy so uh, yeah i'll say Teddy Bridgewater to New Orleans, if anywhere. Marcus Mariota has to be the Colts. Has Dude. to be the Colts. Okay, this I actually like this fit. And if you're going to, obviously with the Colts, you'd rather go get Derek Carr. We keep Kirk Cousins. Whatever. You'd rather yeah. go get one of those guys. You've got a great roster. You've got a lot of cap space, whatever. But if not, a quarterback that can run with Jonathan Taylor there as well, get an option threat with him. Whew. Scary. We, we've seen how much, you know, a quarterback can impact your rushing game, whether it's the Eagles this past year, whether it's the Ravens literally the past three years. Like, it is a boon if used correctly. Marks Mariota, now not the most tackle-breaking guy in his own right, but still fast, um, would just give that off to high floor that, like I said, if you're going out and signing Mitchell Trubisky, you can't bank on. No. The, I tweeted it, but if the Colts go from Carson Wentz to Mitch Trubisky, again, I, I said it would be a nightmare in New York. That's an even bigger nightmare in Indianapolis. The quarterbacks that they should be locking into, given the draft capital they have, in my opinion, because I don't think they're going to be able to pull off no. a Kirk Cousins, Derek Carr type of trade, should be Marcus Mariota or Gardner Minshew. But I don't think they're going to get traded Gardner Minshew because it's within the division. And Gardner Minshew I don't think would cost division. a lot. But either way, huh? That's not their division. Colts. Oh, I'm dumb. I'm dumb. 
they could get Gardner Minshew there. Yeah. Maybe Gardner Minshew is an option. But anyway, Marcus Mariota, I, I would agree with 100%. I think Marcus Mariota should be should be looking at the Colts as a, as a starting option. I think this is a good opportunity for me, too, to reset on my take that there's no – the worst quarterback in the NFL is a good quarterback. And you should not be pursuing bridge quarterbacks. I saw someone who I think follows the Colts or um, – Covers the Colts say the best option is a rookie on day two, say a Carson Strong, whoever falls to them at 46, and then a bridge quarterback. It's like, no, no, you don't need to bring in a quarterback that's going to help you to, you know, a middling season, right? And I think Marcus Mariota, you feel that he can actually take you to the playoffs. Like, you actually think Marcus Mariota is a capable starter, a top half of the league starter, and that's why you make the investment. Bring in, drafting a rookie already that's going to have to be at the se- in the second round, the earliest, pick 46, and signing a bridge quarterback to where they're competing, I think I just don't, having two okay quarterbacks like that doesn't move you forward in being Super Bowl competitive. I think you need to swing a bat on Mariota if you feel like he's a top half of the league starter, or completely tank the season, start Jacob Eason for all 17 games, and get the number one overall pick. No, they're too good to do that. I, I, no. That's I, the thing. They're too good. To, they're too good. I yeah. mean, they, they, they cursed it once last year, and they still almost made the playoffs. Like, it's too True. good of a roster to do that. With I guess it'd be very right difficult now. for them to lose a ton of games. Too much cast space right now. So, yeah, I, I don't think that... I think you have to just... That's why I think a shot like a Mariota, mm-hmm. where it's like, hey, we haven't seen him. Maybe he's Ryan Tannehill now. I don't know. It's Love not to see that. the case, but like a bigger play, a bigger swing than just Andy Dalton. You know? I'm with you. I'm with you. Wide receivers. Best values, some landing spots for these guys. Top-ranked guys on PFS free agency board. I think there is some value into the deeper range as well. Allen Robinson and Odell Beckham Jr. are the first two ranked receivers. Then there's a little bit of a drop-off to Michael Gallup, the Cal- Dallas Cowboys receiver, who I think is likely to resign, especially with Amari Cooper on the outs in Dallas. Antonio Brown is a high-ranked receiver, but does Antonio Brown play, ever play again in the NFL? It's hard to say. Juju Smith-Schuster, Christian Kirk, DJ Charker, and this other tier on our list. And then at the bottom, Will Fuller, Jameson Crowder, Marquez Valdez-Scantling. I'm hearing Marquez Valdez-Scantling and DJ Chark are going to get paid, hmm. like paid, paid. To be these vertical stretchers for another offense. I'm here. That's what I'm hearing. I think yeah. they're going to get more money than people expect. I don't love that for teams involved in those decisions. I don't think you want to be paying those guys top 15 receiver money, but I think that's what they could draw. And I think that does increase the value of guys at the top, like we said, Allen Robinson, Odo Beckham, Gallup, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, you got a few speedsters in Shark, Fuller, MBS. Um, Fuller's another one, too. Yeah, you're right. I've said that. The Chiefs should be in play for one of those guys. I think the Browns should be in play for one of those guys. Um, Allen Robinson, though, the team that I think could maybe go out and get a guy like that, Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, obviously, TBD on if he'd even want to go back. If he doesn't want to go back, I think the team that then makes sense to me is the Indianapolis Colts. They have so much money. He it gives you a one-two punch with him and Michael Pittman that you really don't have to do much else. And then, obviously, it doesn't take away from Paris Campbell's possible ascension in year four here as a slot receiver. So... That would be the fit, I'd say, for Allen Robinson. Oh, Beckham's just like, he's not going to sign until next year, I don't think. Yeah. Like, he, I don't think anyone's going to sign him this offseason with the ACL. He's the, whatever price he wants, no team's going to give him. So that one seems like once he's fully healthy, he's going to sign again. So that one's TBD on that. With how much space the Colts have, I know the quarterback position is unsolved. I don't hate them being in the market for some of these guys either. Yeah. I, I, I think they still lack weapons, even with Michael Pittman Jr. Paris Campbell has not lived up to the billing. T.Y. Hilton only getting older. Getting involved in this free agency class that could be smart. Um, if Amari Cooper is released, Jags have a ton of cap space too. I think they're number two or number three behind the Colts. Allen Robinson and Amari Cooper. Fuck it. Just go get go get two legit veteran playmakers yeah. to work with your young quarterback. I'd like that a lot. I, I, I think you talk about helping Trevor Lawrence and everyone focuses on the draft and drafting a tackle at one. Help Trevor Lawrence by getting two guys that get open and run the right routes. Remember last year, you had guys running into each other. The Viscous Chenault thing, like I think the GM of the Jags in Indy said that they're not giving up on Chenault, but I don't think you should be playing on him be your, your true number one. I think going and getting a guy like Allen Robinson and Amari Cooper, double dip at that position, especially if he's released, I think will make sense for the Jags. For the Chiefs, they're often highlighted as this team that needs to go make a play at receiver. Who of this group do you think makes the most sense for them? I mean, Antonio Brown makes the most sense for them. We're being real here. That's they're one of the teams that would sign up. Like they're one of the teams. I think that's that, one of the teams that Brown will play for too. Yeah, they're one of the you know hold your hold your nose and take it teams. <laughs> they like they don't give a shit about off fields. So they haven't at least for a while. So I I don't know. I I, I also feel that his off field isn't great. He's allowed to play in the NFL. 
and you sign him to a zero guaranteed deal, like if you storm off the field, it's over type of thing. Like if you do another thing in Tampa, it's done and we're not paying you anything. I think it's worth it. Now, that's you, all he's get. Yeah, and that's all he's going to get, right? And yeah. that's all he's going to get. Tight ends. I looked at this entire tight end group expecting that I wouldn't like a lot of these names. The game I wanted to play with you with this tight end group is at what point would you rather draft someone in this admittedly not high-end tight end class in the draft? At what point would you rather draft a guy than sign one? Because going down this list, Gronkowski, Zach Ertz, Gerald Everett, Evan Ingram, Max Williams, I, I, maybe you take a flyer on the guy in the draft, Seiju Uzama, Mo Ali Cox, Robert Tunyon, Jared Cook, OJ Howard, Jordan Akins, all tight ends, all available. And as we know about the tight end position in the NFL, it's very rare that tight ends on their rookie contract exceed expectations. I mean, Kyle Pitts only found the end zone once last year and it was a legitimately rare breed. I'm of the thought that if you have a need at tight end or you want to add talent, at tight end, do it with one of these guys. Go bring in Evan Ingram on the market. Go bring in Usama or Mo Ali Cox. Find a way to fit them into your offense. Guys that have played in the NFL for a while and are already past this like developmental arc. Then, then drafting like Trey McBride in the second, that's where my head's at. Yeah, the one, the one name like the re the rest of this name you can kind of miss me with. I don't think anyone's really going to be a difference maker. Should I sign him? But the one name that it would intrigue me, that I think should honestly go sign like a one year prove it deal with someone who knows he's got to get featured in is Evan Ingram. Then obviously had the who's who of offense coordinators that you don't want to work with at the NFL level. It's going to be difficult to produce good numbers with. And even then, in his best year, did have over 70, 700 yards, obviously, that's way back as a rookie. So, yeah, with Evan Ingram, 4-4 four, four speed, 4-4 four, four speed at tight end. And not a good blocker, but, like, can be a space blocker. And for a team that, like I said, if he's going to get featured in an offense to any sort of degree, he's going to put up better numbers than he did with the New York Giants. That's the one guy who would intrigue me because, like I said, there's not a lot of Titans in this draft class that are offering actual speed the way Evan Ingram is. Uh, yeah, I, I don't hate that. I think I think a team will sign him, right? I think a team then, will yeah. get after him. I, I, I think that's Well, I mean, someone will sign him, but it's like, is he is going to – because I don't think he's going to get a big deal. Like I think he should go to a place where he's, like I said, one year approved deal, and then he could get a big deal. 40th ranked tight end in PFF receiving grade last year Bad among hands. 44 qualifiers. Jordan Aikens, the 38th ranked uh, tight end in receiving grade. Mo Ali Cox, the 33rd ranked. Like Not a lot of guys that are world beaters by any means. Gerald Everett at 23, who was one of the more you know, impressive guys, at least flashed at times. Zach Ertz at 17. I, I just feel that if you have a need at tight end, go to free agency. Or if you want to add talent tight end go to free agency this year because i just don't think this tight end group is worth especially if you're drafting guys in the second or third round in this yeah. class right yeah. you were saying okay. the only tight end you take in day two is trey mcbride yeah so don't if you're like hey i might take you know dolchich or whatever in the second round over adding even jordan akins i think that's a mistake before we get to off the tackles and interior offensive line reminding this group that the podcast is sponsored by western southern financial while you focus on your roster moves, Western and Southern helps advance your money moves. Buying your first home, planning to start a family, wondering how to make your money grow. Western and Southern's playbook of life insurance, investment, and retirement solutions helps you rest assured on game day. Team up to understand needs and address goals with a game plan built just for you. Get started at westernsouthern.com slash PFF. Oh, I was going to bring this up at the top of the podcast. There are There's a mixed bag of master gators, gators, if you will, gators for short, on whether they like how often I swear, which I admit is very bad, or mm. they don't like it at all. Yeah. Moving forward, anytime I drop the F bomb, okay, and I'm holding the Master Gators accountable for tracking it each episode, I will donate twenty dollars to the Children's Hospital, Shine's Children's Hospital. Look at you, St. Jude's, St. Jude's, because I do agree I need to stop. I need to stop swearing. I swear way, way too often. It's not creative. Get after it. Got to be better. But. I also need to balance. I need to balance. If I do need to drop one, sometimes you need to drop one. Yeah. I'm sending $20 to St. Jude's Children's Hospital, which again, we also donate um, $100 uh, for every 10 merch items bought from Tailgate to St. Jude's Hospital. It's a big, big focus for the podcast. Off the tackles. Best landing spots for these guys. Teron Armstead, Dwayne Brown, the Seattle Seahawks, formerly. M M M Morgan Moses, Eric Fisher, Trent Brown, Riley Reef. Those are the only offensive tackles ranked inside PFF's top 100 overall free agents. I think all of them can start. I think. I think all of them add solid rotational depth to Not rotational depth. <laughs> solid depth if you need to obviously mm -hmm. get depth at that position as well. Yeah, so the one obviously that you want is Tron Armstead. Now, health has been a massive issue with him. I don't think he's been healthy 
four or five years now. It's been a while since he's played a full season. So you're going to have to have that, take that into account should you sign him. But in terms of like competency, I'm trying to think. Trent Williams hit the market last year. But tackles like him, not every year. You don't get one like that coming out every year. Like he is an elite tackle when he is healthy. So that's the one you want. And to me, that's the one that Jacksonville Jaguars should sign. Is you do what I keep talking about that, hey, there are other avenues than using number one overall pick to get your quarterback some pass protection help. Now, Cam Robinson was the avenue that they've already taken, which, yikes. Uh, we Why'd they double that. down on that? I have no effing clue. That one was just fucking still don't know. I don't even second tag for a guy who's okay. I, he's thanking, he has to thank his goddamn lucky stars he got drafted by Jacksonville and that they're in the situation they're in because nowhere else. He may be a backup at this point had he not gone to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Cam so. Robinson last year ranked 35th among starting offensive tackles in PFF grade. And pass protection didn't even break the top 20. I don't understand how you allocate that much money to Cam Robinson again, especially after drafting Walker Little, the Stanford offensive tackle in the second round, and with Teron Armstead and some of these other guys available. Like I, I think there are other guys available that they could have gone after as well. And now consistency is important for the offensive tack, you know, for offensive line. And I think that's why you have Riley Reef, his best landing spot to the Cincinnati Bengals, at least part of the reason why. But concerning for the Jags, man, to get more positivity off of the Cam Robinson stuff, they had Teron Armstead, Amari Cooper, and Allen Robinson. I don't know. I'm betting a little bit on them to win the AFC South. Maybe. Maybe I am. Especially with Doug Peterson there and no longer Urban Meyer. Uh, the, the rest of these, though, it's like they're all old. Old like swing types, yeah. Well over 30. The, the one fit that I like is Eric Fisher to the Dolphins in terms of, like, they need a left tackle. They, Mike McDaniel needs an athletic dude for their system. I think that's a good fit. The rest of these, it's just like... It's it's really unfortunate because you're really fighting over scraps here, kind of. But it'll be in demand because a lot of teams are going to be knocking on these ass doors. Mm -hmm. Into your offensive line, best landing spots, some value for the mid tier as well. Ryan Jensen is going to be available. This uh, he has not been tagged. They're tagging Chris Godwin. Brandon Scherf should be available. Both of those guys are top twenty free agents on the PFF free agency board. There's also some value. In the mid-tier here, Lakin Tomlinson, Connor Williams, James Daniels, Ben Jones, Austin Corbett, Andrew Norwell, who graded really well at his start in Carolina, has not graded as well, but still hasn't been a dumpster fire for the Jags. Alex Kappa, Brian Allen, Bradley Bozeman, all will be available, all top 100 free agents overall on PFF Sports. Start with Jensen and Scherf, best landing spots. Yeah, so Jensen, I think it's not really been a really secret. I think he's going to go to the Bengals. Um, that's like damn near been reported already. Uh, Brandon Scherf, though, the landing spot I keep going back to with him is the Jets. They're in a great spot, whether it's at pick four, at pick 10, to get another tackle to go across from Mekhi Becton. And you have George Fant as your swing tackle. you got a nice left guard in Elijah Vera Tucker. You have, um, what's his face, the former Broncos center, Connor Out. Oh. McDermott, I want to say. Connor, as your yeah. center, as your I think center. it's McDermott. And then right guard, Brandon Scherf. That's a nice little five-man starting lineup across the line. That, that, to me, is the fit. They got the money. Scheme fit. That Just lock it up. That's the one I like. The Jets. I mean, whoever gets those two guys is getting immediate upgrades regardless of where they're going, right? I think the Bengals and Jets are two really good landing spots. I also think the Bengals, I was talking with Dan Horde, who's the voice of the Cincinnati Bengals here in Cincinnati. He asked me, you know, Tommy what mid-tier free agents... What mid-tier free agents do they go after in the offensive line? I mean, I think they could benefit from bringing Riley Reef back. Riley Reef back. And I also think, like, swing the bat on Andrew Norwell or Alex Kappa or Andrew Connor Norwell's Williams. a Cincinnati guy. Yeah, yes. Andrew Norwell is Anderson. from Cincinnati. I've heard stories, so I can't tell it. He told me I could never tell anyone, but I was at a bar. I guess I can't tell it. Nice. <laughs> but I, I was at a bar where they said Andrew Norwell gets up, dude. Uh -oh. That guy gets after it. In a good way. It wasn't, like, anything... Illegal, but the guy can the guy can put down some bevers. Hmm. I don't know what a bever is, but he can put them down. The but I, I don't hate them going after one of those guys, Connor Williams, Andrew Norwell, especially since he's from Cincinnati. Alex Cabell, I almost think you could lock that up. They could, I, I think they do sign Norwell, Jensen, and probably bring Rack Reef, hmm. and, and that's not maybe the upgrade some Bengals fans are clamoring for. And Quinn, you could speak to this probably, but I do think that's that's a step in the right direction. I think this is also another good time to highlight the sort of difference between tackle and guard in the NFL and like positional value tackle versus guard 
You can go rebuild your interior, right, tomorrow yeah. if you want. You can go sign three quality interior off the linemen off the street, and boom, good. You can't go rebuild your tackle position tomorrow no. if you want. It, that would cost you a pretty penny to do so, and it might not even, like you said, you might have a guy with a massive injury problem and another one who's 35 years old. Yeah. And you can raise the floor of your offensive line significantly by signing into your offensive linemen in free agency because they're yeah. often made available. It's obviously multiple positions. Good offensive tackles don't hit free agency. Exactly. Unless there's a wild cap situation like there is in New Orleans or a guy that's getting older. And, you know, like Trent Williams and Andrew Whitworth, right? Those are two of the best, two of the best offensive tackle signings in free agency we've seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. And there were age concerns, health concerns. And they end up standing out. Uh, again, you're just not going to see top end offensive tackles hit for agency. It's why it's so important to value that position in the draft. It's literally the third highest paid position in the NFL. Defensive tackles. I feel like there's a lot of depth in this defensive tackle class. It's similar to the interior offensive line, where you can go add legitimate talent. Maybe not obvious upgrades. None of these guys are world beaters, but guys that, again, raise the floor of your interior defensive line, starting with their first four on PFF's free agency board. Akeem Hicks, Clayus Campbell, Folorenzo Fatukasi, BJ Hill. All four of those guys, in my opinion, are starters. All four of those guys raise the floor of your defense and can come in and play right away. And then even after that, swinging the bat on a Linval Joseph, Tim Settle, Maurice Hurst, Derek Nottie, Bilal Nichols. I, I think there's value there. I think there's specifically value in like run defenders, right? You're not yeah. going to get this high-end pass rusher at the defensive tackle position hitting the market. But you can go, like, Fuller Runzo Fatukasi is a good run defender, and it's graded really well for the Jets. Same with B.J. Hill for the Cincinnati Bengals, Calais Campbell. You can go get really good interior run defenders in free agency on a, on a dime, really. And I, I do think that teams should value raising the floor of their defense with adding some of these guys. Yeah, like, if I, the team I keep advocating for is the uh, Chargers. Sign two of these guys. Go go really remake your interior. Yes. Go get a BJ Hill and a Keem Hicks and say, Hey, we if Jordan Davis falls to us, sure, we'll pull the trigger. We like if we like him, pull the trigger, but don't keep yourself like I said, pigeonholed into a position in the draft. It's never what you want to be. So yeah, I I, I like the run the ability, even like a Harrison Phillips, the, yeah. the Bills guy. Like I, I like the ability to plug in run defenders from this free agent class and, and again it won't come too expensive edge defenders this hat there is some talent some startable upgrades in my opinion in the first four that should be available but after that like i don't like what's available from a depth perspective a ton you're not getting upgrades not at bad. least von miller who's the fourth ranked free, free agent on pff's board Chand chandler jones should be available to davion clowney Randy Gregory. Those are the first four. After that, Emmanuel Ogba, Melvin Ingram, Hassan Reddick. Then you have Justin Houston, Jerry Hughes, Derek Barnett, Charles Harris, Jason Pierre-Paul. Those are others that are ranked inside the top 110 on PFF's free agency board. I think if you want an upgrade along the edge, you're going to have to get one of the first four. If you're going to want this rotational piece and just kind of add depth to that position, I think you go after that and start adding some of these other guys. I don't know. I, I do think there's other talent to be had. I think Jerry Hughes still has some left in the tank. The guy I bought into as a breakout last year, who I am floored that we were so low on, is Charles Harris. I go back and watch his tape. I think that was for real to a degree. Like I think he is a guy who can be an upgrade for a bunch of teams around the NFL in terms of what brings his table as pass rush. So he's a guy who, if is coming for not too much money, I would be interested in if I am running an NFL franchise. But the top four guys are, I think, impact players. The one... Uh, Von Miller, I think the Rams have to kind of stay there. I think they got to. He's been teasing to go back to Denver on his been, So it's either Denver or there. I think it's where he wants to go. But through the Rams, you got to keep that guy in house. Chandler Jones, the interesting spot to me is if, you know, they do cut Frank Clark, the Chiefs do. Chandler Jones would make a lot of sense in terms of just replacing what he was to that defense. Um, Javon Clowney. Best landing spot for him, I, I don't know. His knee and whatever is still an issue. But I think the Chargers, with what he can do in run defense, that would be an upgrade as well. We keep talking about run defense, run defense, run defense for them. It was so bad last year. I think he could be an upgrade there. And then Randy Gregory, I would love to see him go to the Colts. The way they covet athletes, across from Quiddy Pay, just another piece of that mix. They got the cap space. That could be, that could help that D-line. Ballard has not gone to the free well to add a lot there. 
So I think that would be interesting. Uh, like, at least they, not gone to spend that much. Yeah. He, he's been more in the, like, Charles Harris is more his speed, a free mm-hmm. agent. Than he wants to draft Randy Gregory's about to be, yeah. Like Ben Banigou. He tried it with the, the Rutgers guy. Um, can't remember. Kamoko Ture. Kamoko Ture. Obviously, he had to pay. He's trying to draft those guys with top 50, top 60 picks. Tequad Lewis, a lot of them. Linebackers. Draft over free agency this year was my initial takeaway. I think the draft is really good. Like you said on the last podcast, the draft is awesome with linebackers. I mean, Leo Chanel just like broke records in my opinion. Yeah. But are there Not some value contracts to be had here? So some of the names that we have, Devondre Campbell, <clears throat> Alexander Johnson, um, Foye Oluokun, Leighton Van Der Esch, Josie Jewell, Dante Hightower, Anthony Barr, Juwan Bentley, Jayon Brown was coveted for the Titans for a little bit, but he's kind of ways away. KJ Wright, a bit older. Are there values there? Are there like... Are there teams? Should teams be seeing some of these names as value adds? I just don't see it. Man, the one guy I keep going back to that I just can't. I, I, I get that he's had injuries and whatnot, but man, Leighton Vanderesh was so good as a rookie. True, so good in Rod Marinelli scheme. That I don't know. I, he's played like I said. He, he's been injured a lot since then. There's a there's a there's reason to believe he's not the same guy that he was back then. It could be, but like. Man, I, I just think that he could be a guy that actually makes an impact on your team. It still has that physical ability. So he's the guy that I'd be interested in as like, you know, maybe a reclamation project. Because like this year's Devonder Campbell. He said he played really well next year. It wouldn't surprise me. Devonder Campbell, I think the Packers like have to keep him. That was so key to their defensive turnaround. I think they're going to pay him as well. Um, Anthony Barr is the other one that I highlight. Is like if you go to a blitz-heavy team that blitzes a little bit more than he even did in Minnesota, I'd be interested in him and his services. But don't love linebacker class. Cornerbacks. There is some value at the top. J.C. Jackson now some officially going to hit free agency. They're not tagging him. I think they could try and sign him to a deal, but at this point, he's probably going to be exploring other offers. He's the sixth-ranked free agent overall, the number one cornerback. Stephon Gilmore also going to hit free agency. Carlton Davis expected to hit free agency if they don't get a deal done. Casey Hayward, uh, Darius Williams, the Los Angeles Rams. Those are the top guys, all top 40 players on PFS free agency board. And then after that, I, I also like some of the guys down low, like Bryce Callahan, Dante Jackson, Levi Wallace, Chris Harris Jr., Kyle Fuller. Raising the floor of your defense, I've said that a thousand times. I do think that's where you can where you can win in free agency. You're, it's rare. There's only like how many guys in free agency every year do you think you can sign and they are marquee difference makers the following season or seasons after that. Maybe like eight to ten guys a year. Maybe? I think that might even be high. Eh, I think that's, no, I think that's selling short. Mar- marquee is, your definition of marquee is obviously like, you know, like that's up for debate. But I think there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 guys a year that like are quality starters for the next team, yeah. which is what you're searching for. Now, are there like of guys who are, you know, Pro Bowl type of guys next year? Five ish, probably a year, if that. But that that's not all you need to be a di- like I said, a difference maker. Um, I will say though, I have no interest in signing former Patriots cornerbacks. They are just they're not going to perform as well when they're not with Bill Belichick. Just straight yeah. up, that's a that's how it's gone you know, over the course of Bill Belichick's career. Um, but J.C. Jackson's going to get paid. So J.C. Jackson, J.C. still going to get paid. I, I go back and forth on where exactly he's going to get paid. Now, the Dolphins have the money to do so, and that'd be a very interesting landing spot for him. Um, the team, I think, like, biggest need and, like, some sort of connection in that Brian Flores now on staff is the Pittsburgh Steelers. And not having, you know, Joe Hayden hitting for agency here this year. Uh, Maybe they get him and Stephon Gilmore. Steelers double dip. That'd be sexy. Reunite with Flores. Yeah, Gilmore, Gilmore still got some in the tank, man, from what he did on the Panthers. Now, no one watched the Panthers by the end of the season, but he was still playing well. I, I'd like to see Gilmore go to – I'd like to see him go to contender realistically, but more likely than not, he's probably going to chase some sort of bags, maybe like the Jets. Uh, will be will the team willing to throw that at him with their desperation at corner? Carlton Davis, I don't know. I, Trevor Sikama seems to think that he's definitely going back to the box, but he also thought he was going to be the guy they tagged. So TBD on that. Casey Hayward, the, the landing fit I love with Casey Hayward is the Bengals. I, I would love to see him here with what they do defensively. Lou Ran Rumo's defense, I think he's perfect for that. Would be a, an upgrade over Eli Apple. And then Darius Williams reuniting with Brand Staley 
in Los Angeles for the Chargers. Now, I get that it's a little cornerback group there, literally. And small. Him and Asante Samuel, 5'9 and 5'10. But with that defense, I'm not sure it's like that big a deal. So that would be interesting. And the Carlton Davis, like the, their decision not to tag him, that could mean, right, that they're closer to getting a deal done with Davis than maybe they were with Godwin or more willing to get a deal done with, you know, because it's, yeah, yeah. not, it's not ultimately a death note. It's like, oh, they're letting him hit the market. It could be that they're in a situation situation where that Davis deal is almost done. Yeah. I mean, we saw that with, like, they didn't they decided not to tag Harold Landry, the Titans, and they got a deal done. They decided not to tag Mike Williams, the Chargers, and they got a deal done. Now, would Bucks fans feel a lot better if that deal came through? Probably. If he hits the market, though, he's going to get paid, like paid a lot. Like Carlton Davis is going to get a lot of money on the open market. J.C. Jackson, Stephon Gilmore, and Carlton Davis are all top 20 players on PFF's free agency board. I think the projected contracts, which you can get on PFF.com. That's one of the coolest things on our free agency board. I know that's biased, and I, I work at PFF, and I'm saying it's cool. But you can go and see Brad Spielberger, who is – a graduate from Tulane, a law graduate from Tulane, who has worked in the cap business for a long time. He's our cap expert here. Projected contracts that he is vetting through agents. So Brad Spielberger is not just like putting these numbers through like a fairy tale algorithm. He's like, hey, I put together an initial list. He's running it by agents. Is this what you think they're going to get? What do you think that's going to hit on the open market? And they're saying, you know, sometimes they'll get responses. He's like, dude, if my if this player gets that contract i'll get fired he's gonna get so much more than that and so he'll adjust based on that information so these are pretty damn cool to go check out on pff.com jc jackson projected contract four years 50 uh, 72 mil 18 million uh, average per year stefan gilmore two years 12 and a half million per year carlton davis four years 66 mil 16 and a half million average per year casey hayward you mentioned him with the Bengals. If he signs to this projected contract, it would be an absolute steal. One year, $6.5 million, all guaranteed. He gets set in Cincinnati. I think that's, that's big that's why, for yeah. everyone. And as for Darius Williams, you mentioned that he's small. And again, Casey Hayward only gets six and a half per year. Steven Nelson only gets $7 million per year. Those are other like top ranked. He's got him at $11 million per year on a three-year deal. He sees that there could be some legitimate market for Darius Williams. Again, just check that out on pff.com. It's pretty cool. Safeties. Top landing spots for these guys. Marcus Williams, who's the eighth ranked player on PFS free agency board. Then we have Tyron Matthew, who's been adamant about getting this new opportunity. I think he's out of KC for sure. Yeah. Marcus May, Quandre Diggs. Those are the top guys. I do think that there's some good depth and the safety position. I think in free agency, you can always add guys there. Jordan Whitehead, J. Ron Kerr, Deb McCourty, Kareem Jackson, Justin Reed, and even Xavier Woods, the Dallas Cowboys. I think there's value in some of those names as well. But of those first four, Williams, Matthew, May, and Diggs, best landing spots. Yeah, I, Williams and May, I'm like, you keep going back to it, I think they're staying, staying where they're at. Yeah. Um, maybe not necessarily May, but Williams, I would, I think the Saints would want to. Uh, Matthew is the one who I don't think the Chiefs are going to be able to fit him in cap wise. The team I keep going back to with them is the Jacksonville Jaguars. They need a culture change. If you bring in Aiden Hutchinson and Tyron Matthew the same offseason, your culture has changed there in Jacksonville defensively. There will be some level of leadership on that defense for damn sure now that's i would pay for that if i'm jacksonville with like how ass it has been for as long as it has been so that's where i lean with that one quandre Diggs, i just feel like he's a raven he just feels like a raven type of player watching him play i'm like this guy's that's like the ravens defense i don't know how to describe it but yeah so quandre Diggs, the ravens you know i don't even know if the money works whatever but that's that seems like a raven I think I think Seattle's going to try and make a play to bring him back too. I know that's yeah. one of the leaders now. You lose, you release Bobby Wagner. We didn't even mention him in the linebacker phrase preview because oh, yeah, now he's shit. just officially released. Yeah, it's just, Bobby it's Wagner patriot. is going to be. I I think he's going to be a patriot. I mean, they're going to bring. <laughs> he's, he, yeah. he's going. That guy still has legs. I mean, you the fact that they're releasing him, it's such an end of an era. We didn't talk a ton about the Russell. We were live reacting the Russell Wilson trade. We didn't get a lot of like prepared takes like we did with the Wentz trade. One of the other takeaways I had is like, Pete Carroll going to be a part of this like rebuild? Like is Pete Carroll going to be part? He's 70 years old, the oldest yeah. coach in the NFL. Is he going to be a part of like what's obviously going to be like a two to three year, re year rebuild where they're completely resetting this roster? Lockett could be on the move. Wagner released. Diggs yeah. could be out. He's quite literally too old for the shit. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like he I is. I, I, yeah, I also I, just I, don't think you want to invest like say they do draft a quarterback at nine. Like, you don't want them going through change there. Like, you want consistency. And if he's going to be a part of a rookie quarterback and the development of a rookie quarterback, you want someone there. I'm not saying, P. Carroll, you better retire. I'm not saying that. I just think he's, he's an old fucking, he's, he's an old coach. That's, that's one for St. Jude's. He's an old coach in the NFL. And if 
they're probably at least, at least two to three, three to four years away from being Super Bowl competitive. That's a long time to be coaching Seattle Seahawks. Yeah, to quote, no, I was, I was going to say to quote Kyle Shanahan, but I don't want to get that we may not, who knows if I'm going to be alive this weekend. Oh, so. man, don't say that. He's not going <laughs> to so die. Know, so I, He's not going to die. So I stopped myself. Don't, that was rough, dude. That's that was rough. Myself. You're going to get canceled for that. Yeah, I know. That was All right. I apologize. Shall we get to trivia? Yes. All right, let's do it. Um, apologies to everybody. We took a week off last week. So if you submitted a question and we didn't get to it, that's why. But we got three listener submitted questions this week. The first one is from Brandon Reiblich, Reiblich on Twitter. Uh, he wants to know who are the six most recent group of five players to be drafted in the top five of the draft? Oh, hmm. top five. Group of five. I'm trying to think of top five picks recently. Um, I'm going to go Eric Fisher. Is he one of them? Yep, Eric Fisher, cent Central Michigan. So that's 2013. Um, Corey Davis, he went fifth. Yep, Corey Davis. Wow. Uh, six most recent. Who else? I'm trying to think. Oh, Zach Wilson? Is that technically a group of five? I, I think that counts. He's technically independent. Oh, independent. I don't know. I don't yeah. know that's... yeah, that's not on here. It's not going to count. That, it's not going to count. It's got to be seven because another guy is from BYU, mm. and that counts. Oh. Oh, well, shit. Well, the other guy yeah, I'll right? give it to you. Yeah, that has to count. Uh, Ziggy Ansah is the other guy. Yeah, there. Ziggy Ansah, the other But BYU they did, guy. so they did reclassify, though, at some point, I believe. They to were in a conference, and then they reclassified yeah, as independent, it, it, so it might not have. And one of these, and it might give it away, one of these guys is not technically group of five, but it's a recent draft pick that did Was not play in a power five school. Okay. I didn't give it away at all. I don't know what. <laughs> oh, okay. So Trey, Trey Lance. Yeah, Trey Lance. Uh, Carson, Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz? Oh, you can't take I don't know. If you're including Carson Wentz. Uh, no, not Carson Wentz. You got uh, – or no, wait. I guess Carson Wentz would be in there. You got two more, though. If Trey Lance is, then Carson yeah, Wentz Yeah, not true. Um, two more. Let's think. But I'm thinking Cap. I feel like someone's going to be so. It's just like feels like it's going to be so odd. It's going. I mean, the top five picks. Yeah. A couple of them are layups. Oh my god! Kill me. Oh, um, Calvin Johnson went to Georgia Tech. Oh, that's yeah. ACC. I'm yeah, stupid. That, that's group stupid. Five. I just think they're one of the smaller. Way, power way five more recent teams. than Calvin Johnson. Way more recent. Okay. I'm dumb. One guy's still awesome. One guy's not. Maybe not in the league anymore. Oh wow. Blank in this. I don't know. Just what, tell us. what positions? What positions? Okay. Quarterback and edge. Quarterback and edge. Oh, I know. Khalil Mack's one. Khalil Mack. Ah, he went to Buffalo. And quarterback. Last one's a quarterback. He's probably not in the league anymore. Yuck. I don't know. He may be signed with a team. Maybe he's on a practice squad. Who was? Maybe hmm. he's working construction. Joe Flacco. Sigs. No. He was in top five. I have no idea. Christ. Who? Blake Bortles. Oh, oh the boat. US, UCF King. Yep. Yeah, UCF King. All right, this next one is from Lance Storm. That was a good question. That was a good question. Some of the answers were a little off, Brandon, but the, that was a good question. I like that one. Um, Lance Storer on Twitter wants to know, players have been pushing for the NFL to only have grass fields since Odell tore his ACL during the Super Bowl on a turf field. How many teams have grass fields in their stadium right now? It's I think it's low. I think it's really it's low. low. I know Arizona's is grass. Packers is synthetic grass. Does which that I count? think counts as grass still. It's definitely it's not. The true. Raiders used to be grass, not anymore. Um, let's see. Ravens is Bermuda grass, obviously. We've established that. Mm. I forgot about the Bermuda grass episode. <laughs> I, I would guess. I would guess six. I would guess nine. Six and nine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not six and nine. Is it eleven? No, it's more. Oh, really? Okay, fourteen. 14. More. Oh, no wow. way. Yeah, eighteen. Less. Why does if that Somewhere if that there. many stadiums have grass? I don't understand why 16. all of them don't have grass. Half. Sixteen. Yeah. Huh. Even split. Fifty-fifty split. There's been such a big movement from players to get more grass fields because of how much turf is costing ACLs. Yeah. I think that should be. I, I know it's more money to upkeep grass than it is to do turf and if you're going to make any change ever it needs to positively affect money i do think that getting players less hurt though if the, if the players union nflpa could get that done i think that'd be sick 
All right, last one. Wouldn't be a um, trivia segment without our boy, without Perk. our boy Perky. Perk uh, season. Yeah, Perk says he wants to know the Senior Bowl MVP award has been largely given to the best QB during the week. In fact, the last time a non-QB won the award was in 2015 when this running back won the award. Who is it? 2015? Yep. Second round draft day. 2016 draft. Ooh. Yes. No, I lost it. 2015. So who's second round that year? That was Zeke. That was Derrick Henry. That was... Uh, Derrick Henry was in the second round. Yeah, but I doubt it was him. He was in the senior, right? He was a junior coming out. Um, I'm trying to think who else was second round that year. Seniors? I don't know. 2016? Let me think. Do you want a school? Yeah, yes. School. Nebraska. That probably gave it away. Rex Burke? No, not Rex Burke. Oh, it was Monty Ball. No. He went to Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Oh, no. I'm, I'm missing those schools. Nebraska. Oh, it was the Amai. Uh, um, oh, I see. Yep. Close. Spit it out. Oh, my God. Amir Abdullah. Yep, that's him. Go. Nice. Nice. That's it. That's all I got. That was sick and terrible on my part. I stink. <laughs> I legitimately stink at trivia. Well, you haven't used the three in one, so not that bad. That's true. That's true. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Tailgate. Tomorrow we'll have the mailbag episode, listener mailbag questions answered on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, also some speakpipe.com slash tailgate. Voicemails to listen to. Make sure you tune in. Until next time, Austin Gale, Mike Renner, Tailgate.